Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Welcome to Bishop Presbyterian Church. If you are visiting with us, we are glad that you're here. Um, we are gathered here to worship together. Before we begin, I would like you to turn your attention to the announcements. We have a few things in our bulletin to go over. First off, I would like to introduce you to the Reverend Tom Curry, who is going to be preaching for us today. We're very glad that he is here. Um, Tom Curry was born and reared in Carthage in a largely blended family. During one part of his ministry, he raised and donated goats for the Hunger Ministry Heifer International. He retired to the Curry home place in Carthage in 2005 and now does supply preaching. We are very glad that he is here. Um, the flowers today up front are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of Leela Asbel. The flowers on the organ over here were donated by the Cavalry Temple Church in thanks for the small piece of land that we have given them for what looks like a parking lot at the moment. Um, the men of the church will be having their breakfast next Sunday. The details are in your announcement. Um, on April 30th, so not this coming Saturday, but the next, our Ukrainian native Sophia Chanla will be hosting a musical performance fundraiser. It's going to be a spectacular uh, performance. She is an amazing artist, um, and all of the proceeds of which are going to be going to the relief in Ukraine, so the details are there. Um, anything else? Oh, one great hour of sharing. Uh, one great hour of sharing, I think, is starting this Sunday, and the idea is to give, donate what is the equivalent of one hour of your salary's worth to others, um, and the information is all right there. So, there we go. Um, how good it is to be here in God's house to worship together. We're here today on Easter Sunday, and some of us may be together with family that we don't get to see very often, and some of us may be fam missing family that are not here today. Many of us are filled with thoughts of Easter plans later today, or of work or school, and all of those things crowd our minds. All of these things are important, but in this hour, nothing is more important than the worship of Jesus. So let us lay aside these things that would crown our minds, and let us think of the Lord Jesus and worship him this morning. Good morning again. As you know, I'm Tom Curry, a visiting pastor, and I'm glad to be with you today. Easter is not just a special day in the life of the church. Easter is the special day in the life of the church when it is confirmed for us again each year that in Jesus Christ we find the one who has the final say in our lives, in the life of our nation, 
and in the life of our world. This is a time when we come to affirm that the ways of Jesus are the way we are to follow and not the ways of the world. But we're grateful to be here and to worship him on this Easter day. Will you join with me now in the responsive call to worship? Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. He is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. So the women left the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. This, this is, is Easter, Easter Sunday, Sunday, and Jesus, Jesus has risen indeed. Hallelujah.
Precious God, on this beautiful Easter morning, we gather for worship. We gather to remember that he is risen, that Jesus is in our midst even now, and that he has worked for us to do, and he has called us to be renewed as his people once again. There's a purpose for us being here. There's work ahead of us in the world, and we know that the final word in our lives in the life of our nation, in the life of our world, is God's word. And for this we give thanks. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer which Jesus taught us as his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is Up From the Grave He Arose. It's the insert in your bosom. And we'll stand to sing.
We'll stand now for the prayer of confession, the assurance of pardon, and the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand? Now, what makes Easter so special is not our righteousness, but God's amazing grace. And so we always have early in the service a prayer of confession to remind us that we're saved by that grace so that we do not drift into the greatest of, one of the greatest of, Christian sins, which is self-righteousness. Let us join together now in the prayer of confession. Mighty God, by your power as Christ raised from the dead to rule this world with love, we confess that we find this hard to believe, but fall into doubt and fear. Forgive our lack of hope and faith. Forgive our fear of dying and of the future. Set us free for joy in the victory of Jesus Christ, who was dead but now lives, and he will put down every power to hurt and destroy when your promised kingdom is completed. This we ask in the name of our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. Hear and believe this good news. Having confessed our sins, we are forgiven, and the gift of a new beginning promised to us by God is now ours. Amen. The glory of God. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Problem with a different pastor, you've got to learn a new routine. Let us join together now with the Church of All Ages 
and the church around the world as we confirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's turn to God in prayer. Gracious God, as we gather today, we gather giving thanks that you have called us to be your people. You know us inside and out. You know our thoughts. You know our words. You know our actions. And therefore, you know that we're not worthy for this great calling to which you have given us. You have given us the words of salvation. You have given us a witness to the risen Christ. You have given us as an example of how you want people to live together in our lives and family, in our lives in the church, in our lives in community, and in our lives as in the nations of the world. And we are grateful for this high privilege, and we know that it is beyond us. But with the help of your Holy Spirit, you have a purpose for us, and we are grateful that we have this wonderful good news. We're grateful for the joy that you have called us to share with others. Joys of salvation and forgiveness and a new beginning. Joy of teaching others to live in sacrificial love and to always put you first in their lives. And as we gather today, we are grateful that we are your church in the world. And we pray that when Easter Sunday is over, we'll still live as the people of Easter the rest of this year and the rest of our lives. As we come together, we give thanks for this congregation for those in this congregation who provide leadership and give us a chance to develop our leadership here as well. We're grateful for those who have helped us in our faith, and we're grateful for those who give us the opportunity to help them in their faith as well. And we look at the children coming up in this congregation, and we pray that we may be your faithful stewards as we pass on what we know about you and what we believe you want how we believe you want us to live to them so that it becomes a natural part of their lives to wear as well gracious god we look around us at the world and we see even in the bulletin of this church an announcement about money to help those in ukraine as we think about all the evil that goes on around us about the invasion of that country and all the hard decisions that the leaders not only of our nation but the other nations of Europe and of the world must make as they to try to decide how to defuse that situation without starting an even bigger war and uh, that would affect the whole world. And we pray that you'd be with those people who are suffering there and especially with those who provide help for them, whether it's military or food or whatever they do or just the encouragement and prayer that we give them. We also pray for those in our own country who during the last four or five weeks have been wracked by one storm after another coming across from the west to the east, those who've lost businesses and families and lives as well. And we're, we remember those individuals in this church, in this community who especially need your help right now. And we pray for them. These are not easy time to be a Christian, 
There's so much to do, and often we feel like there's more than we can handle. Help us to remember that what we do, we do in your name so that we will be faithful. Hear these our prayers, O oh God, for we ask them in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. At this time, we'll receive our morning offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, we're grateful that you give us a chance to give of our material goods for the work of your kingdom. But we pray that as we come with our gifts, we come also to give ourselves as a living sacrifice that you want us to do. Before us each day, you place opportunities and occasions where we have a chance to witness to, to your love for us and how it is you want us to live. Help us to lay those opportunities 
on the table along with our money, that we may act on them and be your witnesses in the world. For our prayer we make in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated. Easter week has been a long week, and it started last Sunday with Palm Sunday. And I want to read a scripture that talks about Palm Sunday uh, from the prophet Zechariah. And it's Jesus, the prophecy about Jesus entering Jerusalem, the Messiah, riding on a donkey. Because Jesus picked that out. If the disciples had been asked how they wanted Jesus to go into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, it wouldn't have been riding on a donkey. But that was a self-sacrificing love of the one who gave his life on the cross and then was raised on Easter Sunday. So I want you to remember this donkey as we talk about Easter Sunday today. And here's the prophecy from Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the fold of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war host, horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And then from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, reading the, that entire uh, chapter of, or the first 15 verses of that chapter. After the Sabbath, at, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and indeed you will, he is going ahead of you <coughs> to Galilee where you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said greetings, and they came to him took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to him, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, for there you will see me. While they were going, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priest everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You must not say, you must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ear, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and the story is still told among the religious leaders to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Jerusalem, went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they <clears throat> saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to him, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let us pray. Oh God, we've heard your word read. Speak to us now in a way in which it becomes real in our lives. For this prayer we make in the name of Jesus Christ, our crucified and risen Lord. Amen. One of my favorite fictional characters uh, over the years is a man named Horatio Hornblower who is a British sea captain created by the author C.S. Forrester. 
In almost a dozen novels, Forrester traces the rise of this character from a young raw midshipman to a much admired admiral during the time of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe in the early 1800s. I think that I admire this character because he is so very human and knows his weaknesses as well as his strengths and his life is always a struggle with self-doubt. In one of these novels, Hornblower has been captured by the French and is on his way to Paris to be executed by Napoleon's government when he escapes with his second in command and one seaman. The French think that the three have been drowned in a river uh, in a winter flood and report them dead. But they're instead hidden by a sympathetic French family and six months later, they make this way down the river to a port. It's almost like going down the Cape Fear River to Wilmington and then from there to the sea. And at this port, they are trying to find a ship, a boat of some kind that they can steal and go out to where the British fleet is blockading the port. And they steal a small British cutter, which is a captured naval vessel, probably the smallest in the British Navy, named the Witch of Endor for a character in one of Shakespeare's play. It's been captured by the French about a year before, and with the help of some galley slaves they have freed, they sail out to the British fleet, which is blockading the French, French port, uh, <laughs> hoping to find a way to escape. And they approach a British ship of war, a large one, just at dawn when only shattered shapes can be made out. Well, the watch on the British ship calls out, Cutter Ahoy, what cutter that? Challenges the officer of the, on watch of the British ship of war. And Hornblower replies, His Britannic Majesty's arm cutter, Witch of Endor, Captain Horatio Hornblower, what ship that? which is the ritual way they used to communicate in times like that. Without a thought, the officer on the watch begins his automatic reply. This is the Triumph Captain Sir Thomas Hardy's ship. And then he realizes that the cutter's statement was quite in incredible. The Witch of Ender had been a, a captive of the French Navy for a year and Hornblower had been reported as dead for six months, and immediately they reply, uh, Hornblower can hear the guns going out on this huge ship, and he hears the watch say, come under my lee and no tricks, or I'll sink you. Later, when Hornblower comes above the ship Triumph, Captain Hardy, who knows Horn Hornblower personally, cannot help but say as he welcomes his back, how did you manage to rise from the dead? The appearance of Hornblower and the, writ and the Witch of Endor are simply beyond belief. Now magnify this experience, which perhaps we can identify a little bit, two or three times and you understand something of the shock of the women who went to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus for burial and found that God had raised him from the dead. Remember that for all Jesus' disciples, the week we call Holy Week had been a wild roller coaster ride of emotions. And the end had and at the end it had ended on a bad note. There had been the high of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem on the first day of Passover week, even though he chose to rise in on a donkey. There a cheering procession led by Jesus' disciples, but included many of the pilgrims who had heard of Jesus' miracles and perhaps some who knew that he had raised Lazarus from the dead only about three days before, close to Jerusalem, did cheer him on, hoping that he might be the one Messiah that God was sending. Then there'd been the low of Jesus' confrontation with the religious authorities who instead of accepting Jesus as God's Messiah, were determined to silence him as a threat to correct religion. These confrontations grew more tense as the week went on. 
although Jesus did not go out of his way to stoke the furnace in any way. Traps were set for Jesus, meant to make him unpopular with the crowds. It was, the obvious, it was obvious there that the leader's unhappiness with Jesus and their antagonism towards Jesus was building to a climax as Passover week went by. There was the high of the crowds coming to hear Jesus teach about the kingdom of God, and many responded positively to his word. They heard his call to love God with heart, mind, soul, and body, and to love their neighbor as they respected and valued themselves. They heard Jesus talking about what it meant to love the, their neighbor by feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, clothing the naked, offering hospitality to strangers, healing the sick, and visiting those in prison who were the outcasts of society. And the crowds were eager to hear Jesus preaching on God's love and forgiveness available to even the most notorious sinner when that sinner repented and put his or her trust in God's love. There was that middle high, middle low experience of the Passover supper when Jesus began to talk about his body broken for them and his blood for it shed for them as if he himself were the Passover lamb. They didn't know what to make of this <coughs> except that he was offering them a new covenant relationship with God based on God's grace claimed by their faith and not on a rigid keeping of the law. But then Jesus spoiled the wonder of much of this by saying that one of them, one of his own disciples, would betray him. And then after that, everything just sort of fell apart. Temple soldiers arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus... Judas, one of the twelve, identified Jesus for the soldiers. The rest of the disciples ran in fight to save their own lives. Jesus was tried in a hasty arranged midnight meeting of the Sanhedrin, <coughs> the highest Jewish court, meeting at the house of the high priest. The charges were trumped up and the verdict decided in advance, but Jesus was convicted of blasphemy against God and sedition against the Roman government, and he was convicted. And he was hauled before Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, so that he could be sentenced to death, for only Pilate had that authority. Pilate saw that Jesus was innocent, and even made a couple of half-hearted attempts to set Jesus free, but in the end, he curried favor with the religious leaders and ordered that Jesus be crucified for starting a rebellion against Caesar by claiming to be the Messiah of God. And Jesus, the Lord and Master, sent by God, was beaten, taunted, paraded through the streets of Jerusalem, carrying his own cross, and crucified by two thieves at the place of execution on a hill shaped like a skull just, si just outside Jerusalem, where his death would be a visible sign to anyone who even thought about taking on the power of Rome. And as Jesus died on the cross, with most of his followers in hiding, <clears throat> watching from afar only by some of the women who had been with him in Galilee, it seemed to both friend and foe that on Friday the Jesus movement had ended. The roller coaster ride of the Passover week had ended with a derailment at the body of a steep hill and the two casualties in that wreck were Jesus and the movement that he had started. The wrath of the religious leadership and the Roman government had knocked both off the track and stopped them permanently. It was three women who had witnessed Jesus' death on the cross who go to the tomb that is his burial place on Sunday morning to complete his burial. His body had buried, been buried in haste to avoid violating a, a Jewish custom about not leaving a dead body <clears throat> unburied on the Sabbath day. The women carried with them the spices that were used to complete a proper burial. Theirs was a grim task, but it was a task of love. The Jesus movement was over, but at least they could see that Jesus got 
a decent burial. But the roller coaster of Passover week had not yet ended. There is an unexpected and dramatic climax yet to come. As they approached the tomb of Jesus, the earth shook. An angel of God appeared and rolled away the huge millstone-like rock that had sealed the tomb of Jesus. The soldiers led by the authorities to guard the tomb were frozen in fear. The women did not know what to think or to do. But the angel said to them, you, don't under you didn't understand when Jesus tried to tell you, but the grave cannot hold him. He's not here. He is risen. Come and see for yourself that the tomb is empty. Now run and tell the disciples that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and he will meet them in that place at Galilee he talked to them about. This is my message from God to you. And run they did, filled with a mixture of joy and fear. Joy that Jesus was alive. Fear that when they saw him again, they would be in the presence of the Son of God. And they knew that he knew that they had been doubters. The roller coaster was not only back on the track again, but it was moving at incredible speed. And then they saw Jesus himself. He spoke to him. They threw themselves at his feet in humility and adoration and worshipped him as the Messiah of God. <clears throat> Jesus quickly quieted their fears and sent them on their way to carry out the joyful mission given to them. Tell the others that I will see them in Galilee. The Jesus movement is alive and well as it is today. And this is a message that we remember and retell each Easter. The grave could not hold Jesus. All that his enemies could do to silence him was to no avail. Sin and death and evil had done their worst, and Jesus had defeated all of them, not for himself, but for us. Jesus of, Le of, Jesus of Nazareth is still not in the grave. The tomb is still empty. He still meets those who are his followers as we do the work and proclaim the good news of God's love and forgiveness which Jesus has entrusted to us. The last words to us from Jesus were our work orders. We are to make disciples of all people, baptizing them into the membership in God's people in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them all that Jesus has taught us about God, about ourselves, and about the kingdom of God. And Jesus himself will be with us in this ministry until he returns to complete the kingdom of God and to banish forever from our midst sin and evil, pain and suffering, and even death. This is God's message for you and me for today. Jesus Christ is risen. The crucified Jesus is our risen Lord. What do you make of this message? What do you, how do you receive it? What do you do with it? Many people try to explain it away as the Jewish leadership did when they paid the guards to say that Jesus' body had been stolen. There are those today who say the resurrection of Jesus was simply in the imagination of his disciples who did not want the Jesus movement to end. Uh, and yet, Look what that did to those disciples. The ones who had been running, who had been hiding, became fearless. They were beaten and frightened and in hiding, but after the resurrection, they were fearless and testified to the resurrection of Jesus as the Son of God, even before the very court that had sentenced Jesus to death. It's not likely that a made-up story would give them that much backbone, do you think? And yes, it did, and the church had lasted for all these thousands of years and centuries this then. Do, do you believe that <clears throat> Jesus really was raised from the dead? But that that was something that was important in the first century, but is not important to us today. Uh, and yet, friends, the world would never be the same again had Jesus not been raised from the dead. <clears throat> You cannot really understand the meaning and purpose of life in any age without coming to grips with Jesus 
in what he tells us about God and about ourselves and what it means to be God's people. The love and power of God, which we see in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ, are just as fresh and alive today as they were in first century Palestine. Don't fool yourself by pretending it has nothing to do with our age, that it's ancient history. The world is wrong. Jesus is right. We are to live as he calls us to live, and that's what will bring the world together and give us the kind of life that is the kingdom, that the kingdom of God, which is God's will for us. The great missionary and theologian of the New Testament church, Paul, said in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with verse 12, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, who can any of you say, how can any of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation as Christians has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. The message of Easter is that important to the Christian faith. It is that important to each of us. There was a resurrection and it shows that it is God's ways and not our ways that will end up dictating the future for us. And can each of us receive this incredible news with joy? And with a little fear and awe, as did the women who went to the tomb that Easter morning. In Jesus, we have seen God, and God loves us. In Jesus, we have seen the will of God for us and know how much we haven't needed God's amazing grace. But Jesus says that if we put our trust in God and accept God's forgiveness and let God keep us and help us in our struggle with sin, we are given the gift of a new beginning in our relationship <coughs> with God. Easter is the good news that God reigns now as he always has. That evil can never defeat God's good. That death can never defeat life. That our sin is overcome by God's grace. That God's love for us is forever. And so each Sunday, as it says at the top of your bulletin, this is service for the Lord's Day. And we worship not on the Sabbath, but we worship on Sunday, the anniversary each week of the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so each Sunday, and the day on which Jesus was raised from the dead, and a new chapter in the relationship between God and all humankind began, we Christians gather to celebrate the resurrection on what we call, not Sunday, but the Lord's Day, and then to go out to meet Jesus in our daily lives, where he gives us the comfort and strength and courage and joy that we need to be disciples in this age and in this place. That is the message of Easter for us, and the message that we are, have been given to tell others. Let us go quickly and tell our world the good news, to tell our world that what our culture and the age in which we live has been teaching as the way to success is wrong, that people need to get off that wrong path and get on the path that God has set for us. We need to teach that love is stronger than hate and revenge. We need to live lives that <coughs> care not just for ourselves, but care for others, especially those in need as well. Jesus was killed as much for the people he went around with as he was for the message he taught because he went to those who needed him and who needed the good news of God's forgiveness. As Christians, we have a message that can change the world, change starting in our own life and our relationship with God and with the people we encounter, changes in our families, changes in the communities in which we live, changes in our nation changes in the world. And right now, the world needs the message we have as bad as it had in my lifetime. And I'm 80 years old, so I've seen a lot of things in a lifetime. The, the world and our nation needs what the church has to say. And God is calling us to rise up 
and live as the Easter people who know what we know about God and who are willing to share that not only in what we say, but in the way in which we live in the world today. So the message of Easter is the Jesus movement is alive and well, and it's time for us Christians to get back on the road and to share the good news of what God has done and is doing in our world today. That's what Easter says to us. It's a scary thought, but God is with us, and because God is with us, and because God has a final say in our lives and the nice life of our community and of our nation, it's the right message that we should have and the world needs us. We are God's good news. We are God's blessing for the world. And the message of Easter is, you got that right, now get out and do it. Let's pray. Oh God, we need a shot in the arm. We need a shot in the arm that gives us a new energy, but that shot in the arm we need is a sacrificial love that Jesus showed when he rode in Jerusalem on a donkey to say that we win by humility and not by pride and self-righteousness and all the things that the world says are so important, material greed and the rest of it. Help us to live as your people and help each Easter celebration be a time when we are encouraged and reminded that we are your people and you have left us work to do. This prayer we make in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand and sing He Lives, which is also uh, your in insert. now in God's service and let these words of the Apostle Paul guide us. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, 
hold fast to what is good, love one another with mutual affection, outdoing one another in showing honor to others. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.